saying to one of my students that I, I am never going to be at risk for teaching in a room this size. Um, and I probably would have to wear a microphone, but for the time being, I'm just going to yell. Um, I'm, really, I'm really excited to introduce John Sides. He's Associate Professor of Political Science at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He's also, as Dean Ray said, the co-founder of the blog The Monkey Cage for which he and the blog were recognized with the 2011 Blogger of the Year Award by The Week. The Monkey Cage became part of the Washington Post last year, and it's also with the Post that Dr. Seitz has embarked on his next big project of congressional election forecasting called The Election Lab, and you can go check that out soon as you leave. Um, Dr. Seitz received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2003, and did his undergraduate work at UNC Chapel Hill. He has published a very long list of articles in our discipline's top <coughs> journals, including the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Politics, Legislative Studies Quarterly, and Perspectives on Politics. Most recently, John is the author with Lynn Babrick of the groundbreaking 2012 book, The Gamble, Choice and Chance in the 2012 Presidential Elections. Nate Silver has called The Gamble, quote, crisply written, comprehensively researched, and carefully argued. It provides the definitive account of what really happened and what really mattered in the campaign. John has also been a dear friend of mine for We Shudder to tally up the almost 20 years. Um, and it's my true privilege to be able to introduce John tonight. And following his presentation uh, of his talk, Will the 2014 Midterm Election Give Republicans Control of Congress? We will include um, our panelists, uh, Dr. David Parker and political science major Marcus Mattioli, in the discussion and then take questions and comments from the audience as well. So, with no further ado for me, take it away. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this is my first trip to be in Montana. Um, I was reminded that when my father was a younger man, he and his brother-in-law drove, uh, drove across the country, including Montana, in a Volkswagen Bug with no air conditioning, somewhere in the 1972 range. So I'm happy to admit that my trip here was much more comfortable than this trip to Montana was. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure not just to see my political science colleagues, but to see good friends like Sarah. Um, I'm here to talk about the question that I was asked to talk about and delighted to talk about is this question about whether the 2014 midterms will be a Republicans control of Congress. And I, I chose a picture here um, that has a sad looking Barack Obama and a grim Harry Reid. And that's as close as Mitch McConnell comes to a smile. <laughs> Trust me, by I googled this a lot, and this, to some extent, represents what they are likely to feel, at least as far as we can tell, uh, on election day itself, or at least in the near vicinity of election day, depending on some potential runoffs in Louisiana and Georgia. Because I know you're not ready for it to be over in November, so let's wait until January when Georgia finally gets its show on the road. So I want to talk about sort of what we can learn about. Think about this election, and um, I come at it from a from a distinctive perspective. You may have noticed that the, after the 2012 election, it really wasn't so much that Barack Obama won the election. That was not the most important victory in the election. The most important victory was the victory of people like me, aka the nerds. Uh, the nerds helped Barack Obama win. The nerds uh, were able to use their math to predict, in fact, correctly all 50 state outcomes for the presidential race. So as a political scientist, it's my natural tendency to gravitate towards data, mathematics, or those statistics, perhaps, to try to understand what's happening in this election where it's likely to go. So I, if that doesn't sound appealing to you, and you go to the, that's fine by me. It's not the first time it's happened to me. Uh, usually it's students. But if, even if the non-students want to leave, that would be fine too. It's just to say that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be long on graphs and short on gossip for this particular talk. So uh, if, if, bear with me. I, I try to make the graphs look pretty. I think the first one that we need to look at is kind of the current state of what the various forecasters are saying about the Senate, which obviously is our interest in this particular election cycle. And there are a variety of Senate forecasting models eight that are keeping, being kept track of the, the website box. Um, I've taken their forecasts here. Um, 538 
the little fox. The T is the New York Times. The WP is the Washington Post, which is me. And two of my collaborators. There's the Princeton Election Consortium. And then on the other column, I saw the Post. Uh, Daily Cost, which is a progressive political blog. Real Clear Politics, and finally, the political scientist, Alan Abramowitz, uh, who gets his own beautiful picture there beside his forecast. And I, I, hope, and I hope these up here, but basically, I, I want to sort of indicate what we have right now, which is pretty strong consensus among the various forecasting models. With the Republicans winning, probably on, on average across these models, 52 seats. And they're obviously, they, they need 51. Uh, 50 won't cut it, you all know the rules. But in 50, the vice president provides a tiebreaker vote. And uh, Joe Biden is capable of many things, if we all know. Uh, presumably, one of them is. Uh, Casting a tiebreaker vote. Although I'm sure he'll say something inappropriate in the course of doing so. So, only the Princeton forecast right now has a head tie. The, the, the main difference among the forecasts, which is not displayed here, is sort of the certainty to which they attach this, these outcomes. You know, how, how confident are they in these outcomes? Um, so, there's some differences there. But there's no, there's no real disagreement as to what they think the most likely outcome is. So, that's kind of where this is. On the House side, no, one's, no one cares this cycle. I mean, you have a unicameral legislature for all we know, um, for all the focus on the Senate. But we do have this other chamber. It is kind of important. Um, and this is the election lab forecast for the House. Um, we have the Republicans gaining about seven seats. There are a couple of other forecasts that are similar in finding that the Republicans are likely going to gain a handful of seats. This is not an election where they're going to gain a lot, like they did in 2010. But it's also not an election in which Democrats are likely to gain the seats. So, you know, the provisional answer to the question of the title of the talk is, yes, the Republicans will likely control Congress. They will enlarge their House majority by a small amount. And they have a good chance of having enough votes to have a majority in the Senate. So the question is why. Um, political scientists forecast elections mainly as a hobby. We're mostly interested in the underlying causes and explanations for why things turn out the way they are. And here there's, a, there's decades of political science research to guide us. I'll walk you through some of the factors that we point to, none of which I would necessarily say should be like an overwhelming shock or surprise to many of you, but it might be helpful to kind of think about it in this sort of systematic way that we do. I want to highlight four factors in particular. I want to talk a little bit about political history and the, and the, the regular pattern of the president's party losing seats in a midterm election. I want to talk about the political climate and, and really the, the barometer of our political climate. That's actually not quite the right metaphor. Um, the strongest wind in our political climate is the president. Um, the president creates the weather, let's put it that way. And in this particular point in time, it's the fact that he's not particularly popular with the president. Uh, and that is obviously creating some headwinds continue to win that order. That is very easy to head the Democrats. There's also a matter of geography. The Senate elections that happen to be up this year tend to occur on the public term. You all know that very well here in Montana. Then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the candidates that have emerged. Uh, and the first three factors are directly linked to this fourth factor, which is why the, the candidates that have emerged in the cycle tend to feature some strong, capable, potentially winning Republican candidates. And you all may remember that there have been elections in the past, especially on the Senate side, where that wasn't the case, where the, the candidates that emerged from the Republican Party were making miscues, missteps, costing the party seats. One had to, the one in Delaware had to make an ad saying, I'm not a witch. And if you have to say that you're not a witch, you're already fighting losing battles in American politics. Um, if you've ever put the words legitimate and rape together, okay, you're already fighting a losing battle in American politics. Uh, you remember the Missouri race from 2012. So this year has been a little bit different, and I'll talk about why that's the case. So just to start with history, this is a, just a graph that shows you in every midterm election from 1946 to 2010, how many seats has the president's party lost for me? And this is the, the fairly well-known result that with two exceptions in this period, uh, 1998 and 2002, uh, the president's party has always lost seats often lost quite a few seats. You can see it in, in, 19, in 2010, the 63 seat 
loss of the Democrats that Obama would refer to as the shellac, which is a quite an apt description, the largest loss uh, in the post-war era. And so there's this regular pattern by which the President's party loses seats. That seems to reflect a combination of a couple of different factors. One is that the President's not on the ballot, and the President can provide what are called coattails to his party's candidates further down the ballot. So members of Congress who are running for the House and the Senate, even all the way around to state legislatures. If I did this for after state legislatures, it would look the same. And you, you all may remember in 2010, the Republicans took over quite a number of state legislatures because of this same pattern. So oftentimes, the president can sort of pull his party's candidates into office. That may be in part because different voters are mobilized to vote in a presidential year. Um, it may have to do with the fact that somehow the president just exerts a sort of a persuasive pull. The second factor seems to be that there may be a tendency for the public to react against the president's party and the party control of the White House by, in some sense, the, the, the theory is called ideological balancing, the idea that maybe we need to get the other party empowered in, on Capitol Hill as sort of a counterweight to the president's work in the White House. So these are both sort of theories that probably wouldn't have some traction that helps to explain why is there this regular pattern that the president's party needs to see. But I, this is the house I'm showing you here, by the way. The Senate would look much the same. And, then, and, and then if you think about the sort of consequences of this, we, you know, part of our forecasting exercise involves looking at elections. We actually look at the period between 1980 and 2012 because we're building in fundraising data as part of the forecast. And the fundraising data is available prior to 2000, just 1980. Uh, between 1980 and 2012, we estimate that the president's party is going to, a candidate in the president's party are going to lose about three points of vote share on average in the midterm year relative to a presidential year. So if you, assume, if you assume that on average three points would apply to 2014, then you know, we're subtracting three points from every single Democratic candidate's vote share. That's pretty significant. So this is one of the reasons why it's, it's going to be a challenging election for any president going into a midterm. It's, it's one reason why it's a challenging election this year. Talk about Obama's popularity. Here is a graph that I made that averages together all polls in the first three months of the election year. So let's sort of back away from the election just a bit, so it takes stock count early on. And what we did here is Calculated the average across all these polls. We have polls going back um, to I think the earliest election here is 1954. I'm reading that correctly. All the way up to 2010. And what I've done is I've ordered them here, obviously in descending order of popularity, and I've highlighted a few where Barack Obama is in 2014. So in the first three months of this year, his approval rating, which is basically the same now, is around 42, 43%. That puts him, you know, the third lowest of any president in this period. He is not George Bush in 2006. He does not have the Iraq War and a variety of other things that's sort of dragging him down. Um, he is a little bit above that. But at the same time, he, relatively speaking, is not popular when you look at it in his historical perspective. And so, I'll also draw your attention to a couple of interesting features. Um, when you look at that previous graph, you saw that the 1998 and 2002 were the years in which the President's party gained seats. Look where 2002 is in that graph to the top. And go down about four more years and you come to 1998. And you know, one of the reasons which, what, why I think Bush and Clinton had this unusual advantage Midterms is because Bush was still quite popular in the wake of the, the terrorist attacks of September 11th. And Clinton also was riding you know, the economic expansion of the 1990s to relative popularity. So you can see in, in this graph, the presidential approval really seems to have some relationship to what's happening in these midterm elections, even though the president's not on the ballot at all. So even though you know, the famous adage from Tip O'Neill was that all politics is local, that's, there's some truth to that. But a lot of politics is national. And so Members of Congress bear the blame or take the credit for what people think about the president themselves. You can see that play out this year. 
There's been a number of articles about this. Journalists love this subject. They love it. They love to say that the Democrats don't want Obama to campaign for them. And they don't. They don't even want Michelle Obama to campaign for them. So said the New York Times last week. And you know that's bad news because the first lady is always more popular than the president. And so even Michelle Obama is feeling the bond to this. So again, this is one of the things that's making it challenging for Democrats to run. Then they get to the geography. And as you all know, 33 or 34 Senate seats are up for re-election every two years. This year's 36 because there are a couple of special elections to replace senators who are stepping down. And what is unusual about this year is that it just happens to be a set of states that are more Republican than average. It's just a, it's kind of a bad, it's just a bad draw for the Democrats this year. They knew it was coming. This is a graph that one of my collaborators made. There are three classes of senators each class stands for election in a particular year. Class two is the year, is the class that's up this year. So he took all the states in each class and he compared how well did the Democratic presidential candidate, this is Obama in 2012, how well did he do in each group of states relative to his national average? So because there are more Republican states than Democratic states, the averages are always negative. They're always in the Republicans' favor. Obviously, the larger states are often the ones that Democrats win, which gives them the Electoral College, which is great. But just here, we're just treating the states equally. We're not we're ignoring the Electoral College. What stands out about the second class is just that the average state presidential vote margin is 10 points more Republican. Barack Obama did 10 points worse in the states that are up for election this year than he did in the national popular vote, which he won by four points. So you all know this because you live in Montana. And you think about the states that the Democrats are having to challenge this year. Which includes not just Montana, but South Dakota, Alaska, Arkansas, Louisiana, I and mean, maybe states that are been challenging for the Democrats. And this in part explains it. And one of the reasons why this is true is because over time, as elections have become, I think, somewhat more nationalized, and as partisanship has become a stronger influence in how people think and act in politics, not just you know, politicians themselves, but voters as well, it's increasingly rare to find mismatches. But where a state, a state or a congressional district voted for one candidate for president and for the opposite party's candidate for the House of Senate. The congressional delegations of the states have come much more in line with the presidential results in the states. Now there's exceptions to that rule. You have one in this state, say the tester. So it's not an absolute law, but it's just to say, given this tendency, it gets harder and harder to elect candidates who are from an opposite the opposite party is the, the, the sort of overall partisan complexion of the state. I think if memory serves me, um, one of the political scientists who studies congressional elections in the House in particular has calculated that there are currently, I think, only seven of 435 members whose partisanship is different right, than the partisanship of the presidential candidate that won their district. Only seven. That's how much alignment there is. And the same thing is affecting the Senate. So when you put these three factors together, you say, okay, it's an intermediate. And the Democrats in the White House, so it's good for Republicans. And the Democrat that's in the White House is not that popular. And we get to compete in all these states where the, the partisanship party tells towards the Republicans. These are conditions that make it obviously a good year for Republicans. So what happens when it's a good year for Republicans? Well, the political science literature would tell us that the candidates are, are strategic about when they run, and the good candidates are particularly strategic. So if you're an up and comer, like maybe a member of the House or a state legislator, and you want to run for the Senate and you're a Republican, you should wait to run when conditions are good for you. That's a strategic decision. Why would you run in a, in, in a bad act, right? That's just a, sort of a, an act of self sacrifice. There are people that do that. They don't tend to be the most experienced candidates. They don't tend to be the most quality candidates. They oftentimes are political amateurs to sort of step up and run and become. You know, either just sort of sacrificial lambs, or else they supply some humor and entertainment um, because they do and say things that are reflect their lack of experience. So what we should expect to see in a year like this is we should expect to see the Republican Party to come up with some pretty quality candidates on average. And I would argue that's what they've done. Now we can sit here and take any one of these Republican candidates. So we can do the same thing with the Democrats. We can sit here and identify um, the occasional missteps they make. You can identify their frailties and foibles because obviously they're not perfect. But it is the case that they tend to be 
believe, would have experienced relatively well vetted candidates. And, and I, the two examples I'll just cut here are um, Tom Cotton, who was challenging incumbent Senator Mark Pryor in Arkansas, and Bill Cassidy, who was challenging incumbent Mary Lane and I put this particular picture up there, up there, and they're both standing there, and they have the same background and the same flag. What is this picture? It's their congressional picture. They're members of the House of Representatives. These are not amateur candidates. You know, these are candidates that have held you know, a federal elective office, and elective offices prior to that in many cases that these candidates have. They have a long sort of trajectory of experience. They're not the kind of candidates that are going to make a lot of unforced errors. So, as you all know from looking at congressional elections, incumbents, both in the Senate, particularly in the House, always start with a significant advantage. It's not easy to knock incumbents off. But the, the candidates that actually can do that are the challenges that have this kind of political experience. So when we did our forecasting model early on, we, did, we started with, we, this is even before we had like, we knew the candidates necessarily were going to be. We just said, okay, let's just start with them. How popular is the president? What's the partisanship of these states? Is it a midterm year, presidential year? And that tilted the forecast already in the public's favor. And then once these candidates emerged, we said, let's factor in how experienced the candidates are. On a scale from zero, never held elective office of any kind. One is the state legislature. Three is a member of Congress. Two is an intermediate position. Four would be like a governor. Five is the incumbent senator. That's just, that's just a scale. It sort of tries to put people in the middle of the magnitude of what they've done. Once we factored that in, the, the, the fact that the forecast went much more strongly toward Republicans to illustrate that they had actually succeeded in recruiting relatively high quality candidates in most races to run against these Democrats. So, let that sort of set the stage for what we think is likely to then happen. We factored in these underlying fundamentals about history and geography and the political climate. We add some measures of the attributes of these candidates and this adds it to a Republican lean year. Then the interesting thing to, for me is to start then to pay attention to the polls. And the polls factor in all of these forecasts that I showed you early on. In fact, the polls are driving almost all these forecasts uh, in relatively equal measure. And it's because we can talk about the quality of polling or the potential pitfalls of polling and the Q&A. But the historical track record of polls predicting election outcomes is very good. There, there may be a couple misses, especially in a Senate election, but there's nothing bad. That's, that's kind of how I think about it. I mean, it's fine to say the polls aren't great, or maybe you miss a race or two. It's another thing to come up with a different set of criteria that you can trust that's reliable. And I haven't seen anybody who has exactly that kind of alternative one. But then, so when I start watching the polls, one of the things that I think is interesting about the polls is that oftentimes they move in the direction that we would think they should move, given the underlying fundamentals of the race. In some sense, campaign serves to push things in this predictable direction. So I, I, since I have in Cotton and Cassidy up here, I'll give you a couple of examples. This is the polling from Arkansas. Now Arkansas is not a landslide, right, for, for Cotton. But what you notice over time, so this poll, this is all the way back in 2013. If you just sort of start, you know, where it says January 2014, You'll see what looks like kind of a pretty close race, the blue line, the red line, the, the cotton line, and the prior line sort of close to each other, kind of crisscrossing. And then we get into July, there's some pretty clear separation. And now we're moving into September, and the two lines have started to move just a little bit farther apart. There's still a month to go, right? I don't want to make the campaign be over. But Cotton's margin seems to be expanding. And if you don't, you know, this is, this is pollsters, you know, averaging of the polls. The other thing that I think is instructive is just to look at the polls, which um, count the number of polls in which Pryor has led and the number of polls in which Cotton's led. And Pryor's only led maybe three, four polls in the last couple months. And a couple of those were the ones that the Democratic Party released. So we'll take that for a grain of salt. This, again, strikes me as movement in a predictable direction. The same thing's been true in Louisiana. Early on, you know, Landry was leading Cassidy. Who is Bill Cassidy? No one knows who Bill Cassidy is. Mary Landry is Mary Landry. If you know Louisiana, the Landry family name is transcends Mary Landry. Yeah. So she's the incumbent. She has this advantage. And then you 
start to see Cassidy poll higher than her. And this last few weeks in particular, you can see that gap open up just the same way as it has. So, okay. so these are a couple of examples. I would argue with Kentucky, Georgia, at the same pattern early on, much close, like close, maybe Allison Bryant is going to beat Mitch McConnell. Maybe Michelle Nunn can be the Republican candidate, but once they, the Georgia primary happens and they get this guy David Perdue, and then you start to see Perdue's lead open up. Now, neither Georgia or Kentucky is necessarily a done deal, but it's just to say that the leads that Republican candidates have opened up in these races is consistent with the underlying fundamentals. It's a difficult time for Democrats to sort of fight back against these other things to win. So, now that I've used the word predictably, two successive slides, sometimes that bothers people, so I want to acknowledge some of the things that might be potentially unpredictable about these kinds of races. And I will say, it's easier to predict presidential elections than to predict Senate and congressional elections. Um, it's easier to predict one thing than to predict 36 things or 435 things. When Tim O'Neill's about politics local, he was onto something. But there is something that could happen. I can think of a few things that we might expect to be unpredictable between now and then. One is that it always is possible that one of the candidates is just going to fall in their place. Like there's going to be a moment like Putty, where he talked about Jennifer Ray, Richard Murdoch in Indiana made similar comments. And I, I went back and looked at Missouri polls, and, and you know, Claire McCaskill was against Putty, and she, they thought it was a little more in 2012, and Missouri not being a particularly blue state. And uh, it was a very close race, and I think. After Aiken's remarks, he lost about eight or nine points in the polls in two weeks. And then the Republican Party says, you know, we don't know that guy, I don't know who that guy is. And then, you know, he's not getting the money, and then that's sort of built on itself. And then, so if there were such a moment in right, yeah, a particular race, absolutely that would change things. There's something we can do to predict that. If I could predict when candidates would say stupid things, I would cash in, I would make some money this game. Uh, but we don't know. So let's just say, um, Candidate stupidity is an unpredictable factor. The other, another thing that's somewhat unpredictable is there may be things about these candidates that we haven't really captured, like that are like intrinsic in the race. Just let's just do Georgia, right? So for a lot of people said Michelle Nunn, she's not just any Democratic candidate. She's the daughter of a senator, a former senator, Sam Nunn, beloved here. How do you factor in the daughter of a senator back? Well, we might actually be able to go back and count all the children of the senators, or wives of the senators, or husbands of the senators, or some sort of family connection and try to see if that helps the senators very much. But we haven't tried to do that. It's a big fact that it's more difficult to quantify. Um, one of the things that David talks about in this book about his forthcoming about the tester, um, race against Denny Raber, is the fact that testers, you know, tester has this persona, right? Farmer, Montana, haircut, you know, the, the missing Missing fingers, so I'm going to get the right fingers here. Um, you know, we have measures of incumbency, we have measures of candidate spending, we have measures of like how much political experience do you have. Like, do we have measures of this? You know, no, we don't have measures of this. Did you lose your fingers in the yeah. So maybe there are things about that that make him particularly attractive that we can't capture. So maybe there's some of those factors that are not there. The other thing that you know we might think about is there's been a lot of news coverage about this, is the extent to which the different parties are have an effective <coughs> campaign, not just the spending part, but the actual work that the campaign is doing. But right now, I think this is where the race stands for better or for worse, depending on the power support. So maybe I'll leave it at that. I want you guys questions or responses.